Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Aohua Vet webinar. I'm the host, uh, Jason from Aohua. Uh, Aohua was established in 1994. We focused on endoscopy system for 29 years. Uh, at Aohua, our goal is to increase uh, <coughs> accessibility and uh, convenience when it comes to endoscopy diagnosis and treatment. Uh, in line with this mission, we are, we are thrilled to announce our webinar series, uh, which aims to bring together veterinary endoscope users to share their knowledge and experiences. This webinar series will take place monthly by providing a platform uh, for open discussion and the sharing of ideas. Uh, we hope to contribute the continued growth and development of the veterinary endoscope field. Okay, next, uh, let me introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Vasiliki. Uh, her clinical interests include kidney and filling gastroenterology, uh, nutrition and uh, diagnostic, uh, interventional endoscopy in companion animals. She holds a GP cert in small animal internal medicine and a GP cert in endoscopy and endosurgery from the International School of Veterinary Postgraduate and a PG cert in small animal medicine from Harper Adams University. So it's your time. I will give you the host, Dr. Vasiliki. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Alha for the uh, amazing opportunity to interact with my colleagues all over the world and to share what I love most, uh, being a clinical practitioner and especially endoscopy, and, uh, both diagnostic and interventional. And uh, we're going today, first of all, before starting the presentation, I want all of you uh, to be invited in YouTube channel, in Aoha YouTube channel, it's called Aoha Vet, where every month we're going to upload uh, a clinical case for you from zero uh, to diagnostics, from, from the clinical um, presentation to diagnostics, uh, to endoscopy, and also to treatment. So it's not going to be just um, only uh, endoscopic procedures, but it's going to be a whole case um, uh, based approach so that you can see how and follow the uh, the know how and follow the uh, the case. And also everything will be recorded and uploaded also to uh, Aoha uh, YouTube channel, which is called, as I said, Aoha Bed. Okay, let's share screen and start the today is going to be a very interesting presentation because it's not going to be uh, general as the first part, which was mostly the uh, introduction. It's going to have a lot of cases on, um, let me share screen, a lot of cases on gastric uh, and intestinal diseases. Okay, let's go. And of course, please, Put your questions, even if they are relevant to the cases and they are not um, purely endoscopic questions, even if they are internal medicine uh, questions relevant to the cases that we will present. Okay, so let's start. For those of you who missed part one, uh, I really wanted you to know a bit about the patient preparation, what we do before we uh, enter an animal to our endoscopic hall. And I have a cat here, as you see. We have to, as clinical practitioners, exclude all the extra intestinal diseases before um, guiding an animal for endoscopy. So we have to have a complete history, a full physical uh, examination, blood work, plain radiograph, sometimes vomiting and diarrhea are just secondary, symptoms of a secondary disease or of an extra intestinal disease like Addison's, like um, other metabolic diseases, renal, liver failure. Uh, so you have to exclude pancreatic diseases as well. You have to exclude all the extra intestinal diseases in order to 
be guided to endoscopy. And endoscopy is not going to give you uh, the answer, the definite answer to an animal that hasn't done all the preclinical workup. Okay, so um, it is mandatory to have at least 10 to 12 hours of fasting. General anesthesia is obligatory and intubation with a calf and a AT tube is obligatory as well because we don't want to have gastroesophageal reflex and uh, have aspiration pneumonia to our patients. And also because sometimes we don't know what we will encounter uh, during the endoscopic procedure. So we have to have the, animal, the animals under um, uh, controlled general anesthesia. The sedation part it's, it's differentiated according to our preferences, for example, and it depends also on the medications that you have in each uh, country, because, um, for, for example, the, the medications that exist in Europe do not exist in the Middle East or, or um, in some parts, at least, of the, of the Middle East. So you have to do the sedation that you're more familiar uh, with. Always put your patient in left lateral recumbency as the cat here. And um, only the only reason for putting the animal in right lateral recumbency is when we put uh, a peg tube for gastrostomy, a gastrostomy tube. Okay. Now, Let's see what are the endoscopic uh, findings, the macroscopic though findings of a normal stomach. The, the stomach should be empty after 12 hours fasting, which means that if you find food, if you find um, gastric contents that are uh, retained after 12 hours, this implies delayed gastric uh, emptying. And some small amount of uh, fluid in the fundus is normal, could be bile, could be gastric uh, uh, fluids. You will see them in the videos that will follow. Rarely a small amount uh, of bile in the antrum. A lot, a big amount of uh, bile in the antrum implies that there is uh, a degree of duodenogastric reflex disease. So. A small amount is acceptable, but a big amount should imply other things and that we should be suspicious of. The gastric mucosa of the stomach is pink and glistening. I will show you uh, to a video. Some foam uh, also may be present in the stomach. The antrum mucosa is more grayish, more, more pale than the fundus or, uh, the, um, or the, the, main, the body of the stomach. The rugal folds uh, are on the greater curvature and all the rugal folds always lead you to the pylorus. So if you're lost, if you're inexperienced endoscopist and you don't know where you are, you will always follow the rugal folds. The rugal folds will lead you to the pylorus, okay? And when you inflate air in the stomach, because the, the stomach is um, uh, like a balloon. So when you inflate air, then all the uh, ruga folds should be flattened. There shouldn't be remaining ruga folds. If they remain like the, giving the figure of a brain, we call that cerebr cerebroform uh, lesions, then this implies uh, hypertrophic gastropathy. And I will show you some cases of that as well. Submucosal vessels seen in the cardia and the fundus only, not in the antrum. In the antrum, we don't have uh, rugal folds. They the rugal folds lead to the antrum, but they're very, very uh, few in numbers compared to the body and uh, the fundus of the stomach. And the pylorus is a star-like shape appearance. Sometimes it's open and um, it depends on the anesthesia. We cannot judge if this is normal or not. But if, for example, you have a delayed gastric emptying and you don't have gastric peristalsis, um, then this might mean that uh, you have uh, hypomotility, some kind of hypomotility disorder. So let's go and see what a normal stomach looks like. These are the rugae. I haven't inflated the stomach too much. Please do not inflate the stomach. For those of you who do not uh, attend part one, again, do not inflate the stomach um, with a lot of air, not because of the bradycardia. Um, you, that's, that's on your anesthesiologist, but 
also because you will not be able to tangle your way through the parts of the stomach. So here you see a lot of foamy material, but it's a glistening pink uh, mucosa. There's nothing wrong with this mucosa. Okay, and there's a very good question here. If I don't find any lesions, if macroscopically my stomach is normal, should I take biopsies? Of course, because in the stomach, even if we don't have macroscopical lesions, we may have microscopic infiltration. And as you've seen right before, let me go here again. This is the J maneuver, which means that I'm looking at the cardia. I'm looking at the, uh, this is the esophageal. This was the esophageal sphincter. And um, let me. We have a problem with the internet connection now. Let's wait for a second. So the first thing that we do when we enter the, uh, the stomach is that we go in, inspect the, uh, the body of the stomach, and then we retrospect 180 degrees back. This is a J maneuver. And we have to do that in order to inspect all the parts of the stomach. Let me go. because I have, again, an internet connection pro problem. I'm sorry about that. Let me ask. I will share screen again, I'm sorry. And I will answer the question that you have. This always happens in the life. So, okay, let's go. Share screen again. I'm sorry. Okay. I hope that you can see me now. Please go to the chat box and say if you can't see me. So as you see, all the rugae are pink, glistening. What about this lesion here? Can you see this lesion where I point here? This was because of my scope. Sometimes you suck, uh, when, you, when you have the suction, you suck the, the mucosa and you leave marks on the mucosa of the, of the stomach. So please assess these lesions and know what you have, what are artifacts and what are not. Okay, let's see the chat as well. Okay, I can, you can see the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Oh, hello to Spain. Many, many greetings to Spain. Hello, Vasiliki. To... Yes. Yeah, we are, we are in front of the computer. <laughs> okay, that's great. That's great. Let's see, you're, you're watching me um, normally, Robin. No problem, huh? Yeah, it's no, oh. it's no problem. Let's see uh, now the, the, the parts of the uh, gastroscopy. First, the first movement that we do when we enter with our scope is inspection of the body. This is our first movement here. And this is what we see. This is the area that we inspect. So right afterwards, we do the J maneuver, okay, which is this is the incisura angularis, which uh, divides the stomach in two parts, in the fundus and in the pylorus, in the antrum, actually, in the pyloric region, the antrum. And so we go in, we retrospect 180 degrees in order to do the J maneuver. And then this is the incisura angularis. You see, this is exact exactly the place that we're inspecting. And actually, this is a very, very important landmark in the stomach, because if you don't know where you are and you see the incisura angularis, you know that on the left, it's the fundus, on the right, it's the pyloric, the antral region. Okay. And then of course, it's the pylorus. We proceed into the pylorus. This is an open pylorus here and here as well, a mildly open. 
And it has these folds, and we will see the significance of the folds in some videos. Okay, now, when we biopsy the stomach, we biopsy from each and every part of the stomach, not only from the parts that you will see lesions, okay? Biopsy, take at least one to two or three biopsies for each and every part of the stomach because you might have different infiltration types. You might have mixed infiltrative diseases. So you should know all of those things. And also in the antral region, this is the region that you will find most of the times the HLOs. The HLOs are the helicobacter-like organisms. We don't have helicobacter pylori in uh, dogs. In cats, yes, it has been found, but in dogs, it hasn't been found. And helicobacter organisms, um, there is a dispute and uh, a discrepancy if they can or can uh, are not able to cause gastric disease. Um, and the bottom line is that they can cause um, gastric disease under certain circumstances. Let's see now. Oh, and another thing is that if you overinflate the stomach, then you will not be able to take good bites, good biopsies. Okay. Now, let's go now and inspect one by one possible diseases that we might encounter while scoping because it's not everything it's not all about scoping it's about knowing what's behind um, the lesions that you're seeing that you're watching okay and observing so the gastric hypomotility disorders due to outflow obstruction and the outflow obstruction is when the the flow from the stomach is embedded is not um, is not easy to towards the intestine. This can be um, caused by two, two main categories. We might have a mechanical obstruction or a functional obstruction. What is a mechanical obstruction? A mechanical obstruction could be due to hypertrophic pyloropathy, which I'm going to show you, um, about hyperplastic mucosa only of the pyloric uh, antrum. And this is a disease that could be diffuse or located only in the pyloric region in certain breeds, neoplasia, foreign bodies, external compression of the pyloric region from uh, neoplastic masses of the pancreas, for example, of duodenum masses. All of these things can obstruct the outflow, the pyloric outflow, and um, this causes actually projectile vomiting to the animals. Either cases, uh, cause projectile vomitings. And the second category is functional obstruction. What is functional obstruction? When we have, for example, an infiltrative disease, uh, an inflammatory bowel disease, an eosinophilic, an eosinophilic uh, gastroenteritis or, an eosin or uh, a neutrophilic um, uh, gastroenteritis or a lymphoplasmacytic gastroenteritis, then this causes hypomotility due to the infiltration. And this is not a mechanical obstruction, then we have a functional obstruction. The, the stomach does not function as it should properly. And of course, any extra intestinal disease, like for example, if you have an animal that has acute pancreatitis, then you will uh, observe that the, there is a huge amount of gastric hypomotility. Uh, if you have, for example, Addison's disease, it's the same thing. Or if you have, for example, uh, hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism can cause uh, hypomotility disorders. Okay. Now let's go to the uh, delayed gastric emptying. What do we find uh, as endoscopic findings? We have when you have delayed gastric emptying and not contractions of not normal contractions of the stomach, then you have a big retention of gastric fluids or whatever other gastric content you have of digested food, of partially digested food um, in the stomach. You have what we call a gastric paresis. We, you do not have a contraction. The normal peristaltic, peristaltic waves are normally... Uh, uh, 
addressed for the intestine and not for the, for the stomach. For the stomach, we say that we do not have normal contractions. And also the rugae are thickened and they do not flatten while, while we insufflate, while, while we put air in the stomach. We have uh, a light reflectivity and that light reflectivity suggests edema. Um, this is the, a very glistening uh, light on the stomach, which I will show you. And uh, also, let's see, and you might have also uh, some, uh, due to the delayed gastric emptying, you also might have some gastroesophageal reflex disease. And you will see uh, in the cardia that uh, you have um, proximal to the lower esophageal sphincter, some signs of esophagitis. Let's, let's see the video. So you will see that this is uh, the, this actually in order to see the, your scope, this is in J maneuver. And you have seen that the, the, this part of the fundus was like a brain. This is called cerebroform mucosal lesions. And I have insufflated so much the stomach that the rugae are not visible in this side, but in this side, it looks like a brain, okay? This actually uh, is hypertrophic uh, gastropathy and not only, not pillar of gastropathy, that was uh, hypertrophic gastropathy. And there is this actual uh, disease, which is called in humans, it is called menetrier uh, disease. In dogs, we call it menetrier-like disease. And we have this cerebroform lesions uh, that are mostly in the corpus in the body and the fundus of the stomach, and they're missing from the antrum and the pylorus. So the antrum and the pylorus are um, normal, and uh, we are finding these lesions fo focused mostly in the body and uh, the uh, fundus of the stomach. And this is what differentiates menetrier-like disease from hypertrophic pilorogastropathy, because in pilorogastropathy, we have an hypertrophic, we have hypertrophic lesions in the antrum as well. So this disease was actually, this is from an article that was published in 2021. It's free access, so you may all have access to uh, have a look at it. It was uh, in a pointer and uh, that had also concurrent granulomatous gastritis, uh, helicobacter and leishmaniosis. This has been, this disease has also been showed in uh, a boxer, only seven cases. Um, an old English, at least only seven cases reported or people who knew uh, what they were seeing and they reported it. Uh, a Westie, three Karen Terriers and a Jack Russell Terrier. And um, the main endoscopic findings were the cerebroform, as I told you, lesions that are sparing the pylorus and the antrum. Let's go now to delayed gastric emptying due to mechanical obstruction. What can cause a mechanical obstruction? We kind of said the, uh, the causes. So it could be congenital thickening of the uh, smooth mus muscle of the pylorus, and it could be not diffuse, could be only uh, localized in the pyloric region, but also it could be um, a diffuse, a more diffuse disease. Gradually acquired aproplasia of the uh, smooth muscle of the gastric mucosa, Neoplasia, polyps, foreign bodies, of course, mechanical obstruction, and ex extra gastric uh, compression. It's mostly seen in brachycephalic dogs, uh, in boxers, in Boston Terriers, in Maltese, in Pekinese, Lassapso, and Sichtus. And it has been also uh, seen in cats, in Siamese cats. Let's have a look at that. So this is mechanical obstruction due to, it's very obvious, due to a foreign body. And as you can see, the foreign body has obstructed the, it's all in the, it's like a mass in the pyloric region. Watch out for these linear foreign bodies. We're going to talk in another lecture about foreign bodies, but watch out for these foreign bodies that are like, this is tie shoes, I think, um, that we have got out. The linear foreign bodies, some of them could be in the intestine and some, um, and a part of them could be uh, remaining in the stomach. So do not push hardly. Uh, unless you're sure that the whole linear foreign body is in the stomach. Okay. So this was an obstruction due to this foreign body. You see that the mucosa is uneven. 
is not normal due to the uh, persistence of the foreign body. So I go in with my forceps and try, try to see, first of all, the tension. So don't go and grab it forcefully, but let's, as a start, try the tension. I have a question here, I think. Let me see. I cannot see the attendees that raise their hands. If they want to talk, please. Who raised their, their hands? I do not have access to the attendee. I, I cannot see who raised uh, their hands. If somebody wants to talk, please take the uh, unmute and talk or just pose your question. Uh, Vasiliki, uh, you, you can see the tennis raised hand in the uh, tennis function. No, I cannot, I cannot see that. I cannot see that. I do not know why. Maybe in the more, no. Uh, the attendees cannot speak until you give their... Yeah, name. but they can, they can actually uh, put their questions uh, in the in the chat or in the Q and A's. Put your questions there and I will answer uh, simultaneously as I'm talking, okay? Okay. Now I can see that you raise hands. Let me see. Okay, now I can see that. Whoever wants to talk, please put your... Um, I can see the two raised hands, but I cannot see their uh, questions. Place your, place your questions and I will uh, answer the questions. Okay. Tanya, Nikos, and Nikolai, please. What should I do? Allow to talk. Okay, Tanya. I found the way. Tanya, please talk. Do you want to talk, Tanya, or not? You have to unmute. Can you hear us? Maybe we, we can put the question in the q and I have to unmute you. Let me unmute. I cannot unmute. I'm sorry. Oh, here, maybe. I cannot unmute. I'm going to go on. Whoever raised their hands, please uh, put your questions in the chat box and I will, uh, I will answer them, okay? Or Jason, please help me how to uh, unmute these uh, participants, okay? Okay, I'll, I will help you. Please go on. Okay. So let's have a look at mechanical abstraction due to a neoplastic mass. Sometimes we have mechanical abstraction due to uh, a mass at the lesser curvature uh, here, for example, or at the pyloric region. Let's see here the mass extending to the pylorus. This was actually an adenocarcinoma that was in the lesser curvature and had invaded the whole pylorus. You see the gastric retention when, when you enter the stomach and you see this retention of fluids, then you should be suspicious of something obstructing the pylorus. Okay. And you will see the mass here. So you saw the gastric retention. You see that it's pooling and it's bile actually and gastric contents. And now we're trying to insufflate all the gastric fluids in order to see what's going on. You see how much of a fluid it is there. I do not want to touch the, to speed it up because it might cause problems in the connection again. So we will have to see.
Whenever you have gastric content, you see the mass here. You see the mass here. It has ulcers. It's ulcerated. But we revealed that after we took out all the gastric content. This You can do that as well with um, a gastric tube just prior to your endoscopy. If you see with an x-ray that the stomach or with an ultrasound that the stomach is full, then you can empty the stomach in order not to do that with your scope, um, especially if it's a big amount of fluid. So now you see the mass. And this is the pylorus, actually. It's This mass is standing right next to the pylorus. And it's forbidding the, all the gastric contents to enter the uh, intestine. And let's go here as well. This is our pylorus, and this is the gastric mass. You see how proximal it is and with how big of affinity this mass is next to the pyloric region. And of course, we always biopsy in the periphery. Uh, if there is an ulcer, we always biopsy in the periphery of, uh, of the ulcer. And these masses are really, really, if there's not an ulcer, you can just bi uh, biopsy the mass, but these masses are really, really tight. Um, and so sometimes you have to biopsy over the same region over and over again. Do repeated biopsies in the exact same spot in order to get a very good chunk. And sometimes it's very, very slippery. You cannot biopsy because they are very hard, like a foreign body, like um, a ball, a tennis ball, that hard. Um, so you can go with your forceps and the forceps, you will see that your forceps is sleeping away uh, from the mucosa. Nico, you want to say something? I know. Please put your, uh, Jason, can you please help uh, Nikos to unmute? Uh, I thought you should uh, allow Nico to. Yes, I did, I did, I allowed to talk, but then I have to uh, ask to unmute and I cannot unmute. Uh, I thought you it have would be to the same way. You have to unmute yourself. I asked to un to unmute and it, nothing happens. This is uh, maybe, this is the problem. Yeah, maybe they should allow. Uh, they, they should unmute themselves. Yeah, Nico, can you unmute yourself? If you can unmute, please proceed and ask me whatever you want. And also, Alan. I will allow you to talk as well. And please unmute. Okay, yeah, and I unmute now. Oh, great. Alan is the first one. I didn't do anything. Um, so the other two have to unmute. Please, Alan. Yes, I unmute. So I'm No, no, you, you wanted to ask something. Uh, what do you want? You raised your hand. Did you want to ask Sorry, something? I think I think I, I did the wrong type. Sorry, the wrong type. No, that's okay. That's great. It's, it's nice to meet you. Nice I hope to meet you enjoyed you. this nice good lecture you. as well. Sorry. No, no, no. That's great. Okay, let's mute again. Let's proceed. Okay, and this is uh, an antropolyp. This polyp has not actually um, obstructed the pylorus yet, but it will eventually, if we leave it, getting get bigger and bigger. But this mass here, even if it's a polyp, will cause uh, gastric hypomotility and antral hypomotility. So this means that the uh, this animal actually, uh, this dog was vomiting. Um, and was not responsive, uh, responsive, uh, responding to antiemetic, to common antiemetic treatment. Let's go and have a look. So do I have to biopsy that? Can I say microscopically it's a polyp? Of course, you always have to biopsy lesions. Okay, and you will see here 
that there is a pyloritis, there is an inflammation in the pylorus and the pylorus is open. Could this be due to sedation? Yes, could be due to sedation. Could this be due to hypomotility disorder? Yes, could be due to hypomotility disorder. So we always biopsy. And I think that here uh, I am biopsying in this video uh, as well. And it, it would be great if you could take two or three biopsies from the, uh, from the mass. And as I said, it would be better to do that at the same spot every time, not different spots, because you're gonna, you want to go deeper and deeper uh, in this um, uh, lesion. Okay. And as you see, it's very, very, people think it's very easy. Uh, for polyps, it's easier than uh, adenocarcinomas, for example, because polyps are much less, um, are, are much softer. And also, if you if you watched what I did, is that when I go to the mass and grab it, I take out air from the stomach because I want all the tissue to come up to my forceps. So you go, you grab, and then you uh, suction. You take out the air so that all the tissue comes um, up on your forceps, and then you slowly grab the tissue. This gives you better uh, bites, better uh, biopsies. Okay, let's see what findings we have in gastritis. And what kind of gastritis do we have? The infiltrative types, you know them, lymphoplasmacytic, eosinophilic, neutrophilic. Most of the times life is, you know, uh, is not that, or medicine is not that, um, uh, that easy black and white. Sometimes you have mixed, and most of the times you have mixed infiltrations, um, except chronic diseases that are mostly lymphoplasmacytic. Okay, so as we said, the stomach may appear grossly normal. This doesn't mean that you will not get your biopsies. We may have increased mucus and increased number of uh, follicles, of lymphoid follicles, and I will show it how it looks in, uh, in the videos. We can have mucosal friability, thickening, uh, granularity mostly in the intestine, erosions, we might also detect erosions or ulcers, um, reduced size or, reduce, uh, sized or um, uh, reduced uh, numbers of uh, rugal folds, prominent vessels in atrophic gastritis and abscess of peristaltic waves, which are not called peristaltic waves. Uh, actually, it's, as we said, gastric contractions. Let's go and see. This dog had um, diffuse gastritis. And as you see here, we have gastrointest uh, gastroesophageal reflex disease. This is the Z line. Do not miss, uh, take the Z line as gastritis or as esophagitis. This is the transitional line from the esophagus to the stomach. And here we are, the J maneuver, you can see that uh, the stomach, this is a diffuse gastritis. The stomach has patches of hyperemia, edema. Um, we have some foamy material and saliva, which are in normal uh, stomachs as well. Alan, thank you from the United States. Okay. And let's go on. We leave then the J maneuver and we will go to see, to inspect the antrum and the pylorus. You see that all the rugae lead to the pylorus. If you don't know where you are, you will follow, as I said, the rugae and the only lead to one way. Now we're back in the esophagus because I wanted to take out some air and I had made the loop. Whenever you make a loop, uh, which means that you use more organ than you should, then you should go back and straighten your scope and then go in again, but with less air in the stomach. Okay. And you have seen the radiance of esophagitis in the esophagus that goes circularly. Okay, so now I'm seeing verruga. Here 
where you see the spot of less rugae, this is where the pyloric region, the antral region is. So even if you go blindly, if you just close your eyes and go blindly into the stomach, you will reach the pyloric region. This is the region that you will always reach. And you see here the pylorus that's overfolded and tightly, tightly closed. Okay. This overfolded pylorus can be seen sometimes in hypertrophic uh, gastropathy. This dog didn't have a hypertrophic gastropathy, but um, overfolded pylorus could be uh, a lesion, could be abnormal, but it, it also uh, can be normal in some dogs. So you have to actually estimate all the surroundings and everything uh, in the stomach in order to, to say that this is normal or abnormal and also take biopsies, because if you find fibrosis, then it's hypertrophic uh, gastropathy. Let's see a dog with eosinophilic gastritis. And the, the question, the most often question that I have is, uh, can I detect if it is eosinophilic or if it's neutrophilic or if it's lymphoplasmacytic just from the macroscopic lesions? Of course not. If we did that, then we would be gods, not, you know, doctors. Of course you cannot. You have to take biopsies for that. Let's see, um, can I'm patient with eosinophilic uh, gastroenteritis? And actually you see a lot of retained food in the esophagus. This dog has esophagitis stage two or three to the Savary miller classification system. You see that we have radiants of linear lesions of esophagitis that are in circumferential uh, disposition. And here you can see these lesions of esophagitis. And when we go into the stomach, as you can see, it's, it's a very bad situation. Ulcers, ulcerated lesions, retention of food. This dog actually in order to has abdominal discomfort and in order to uh, help its digestion, eats um, this is called pica. This dog eats everything or licks surfaces. Uh, this is, these are the hair of the, of, of its owner. So, um, licks all the surfaces of the, um, of the house. This is one of the primary symptoms of maldigestion disorders. And you can see a lot of lesions, uh, ulcerated areas and, of course, when you, and you will biopsy these areas, and this was due to eosinophilic uh, gastritis, watch out for Rottweilers and for other breeds that could be prone to hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Um, have an ultrasound uh, to these dogs and an FNA from liver and spleen in order to, and also a bone marrow aspirate in order to exclude, especially if these uh, animals have peripheral eosinophilia, in order to exclude hyperosinophilic syndrome. And as you see, I was trying, I was not trying to biopsy this first time. I was trying to see if there was a foreign body in the materials that this dog has had ingested in order to remove it, but it was only uh, hair and uh, very, very soft. So as you see, it has some plastic uh, things here as well, but very, very small. Nothing that could cause this uh, magnitude of gastritis. And every time I go to the questions, my videos are stopping, so I'm not going to go. So as you can see, it is diffuse ulceration. And it's pretty active. It's ongoing and pretty active. It's not crater-like. You see that it's like linear ulcers and it's not dotted as I will show you later, but they're very, very fresh. They're red. Okay, and I'm trying to see if there are any other foreign bodies that could have caused this situation, but these foreign bodies are really, they look big in the endoscopy, but they're really, really tiny. They, could, they couldn't they could have caused this kind of uh, ulceration. The primary cause was the eosinophilic gastritis and the animal was swallowing things. Uh, it had pica just to um, 
alleviate this discomfort, this abdominal discomfort. Let's go to this one. And this is a cat with lymphoid hyperplasia. You see in the cat that the mucosa is much, much paler than the dog. Okay, and you see these lymphoid nodules, these nodules here. And there are a lot of other nodules in this cat. You will see that. And that, that was lymphoid hyperplasia. It was not lymphoplasmacytic gastritis, um, but it was probably due to food allergy or some kind of reactive disease. And this is the kind of biopsies that you have to get. You see that how much these, the biopsies are bleeding. This, is, this means that you got a very good chunk of the biopsy. So you've seen the, the nodules. Let me go to that again. They're not very prominent. These are whitish, these whitish nodules that um, you have to biopsy. And they are here as well. So they're in multiple places. Okay, and as you see, again, whenever I go to grab a biopsy part, I take all the air out so that all the mucosa comes up to my forceps. And this is why we take such a big uh, grab. And in the stomach, you have to do this up and down movement a lot of times. Don't just force the biopsy out from the first uh, grab. Just give you know, give it some time, go up, for, go up and down with your forceps so that it ever, so that it's cut evenly from the stomach and not left behind. Okay, lymphoplasmacytic gastritis. This is a very, very stressful diagnosis for all of the vets because I know uh, a lot of my colleagues actually call me a lot of times and they say, oh, this dog again has, you know, mild lymphoplasmacytic gastritis or enteritis. What do I do with that dog? Do I give cortisone or not? Please, you can have an infiltration of uh, lymphocytes and plasmacytes uh, in the intestine and in uh, the stomach due to other secondary um due to it could be reactive this is what i mean you could have another disease and if you have a liver disease for example then the stomach and the intestine could be infiltrated by uh lymphocytes and plasmacytes okay so you have to exclude the reactive infiltration in order to say that yes this dog has idiopathic um inflammatory bowel uh disease and do not give cortisone in very, very young animals. When an animal comes in, it's six months old or eight months old, it could not have inflammatory bowel disease. Maybe for the allergy, it's a more, you know, consistent diagnosis. You see now these red dots. It's like this stomach has chicken pox. You will see them when I insufflate all the, now I, I'm, I'm taking out all the, the air and the saliva and I have put my forceps. You can see these dotted areas. These are not ulcers. These are erosions. Okay, superficial erosions. And this is a very typical pattern of food allergy as well. I don't know if the, the age of this dog, because it's not written here. Uh, we have hidden the, the data. And you see that when we take the biopsy, the biopsy should be bleeding. And it's everywhere. It's diffuse. All these small dots. Okay. And you should take biopsies from each and every part of the stomach. So is it idiopathic? Is it inflammatory bowel disease? Or is it something else that causes infiltration from lymphocytes and uh, plasma sites? So it could be allergy or food uh, intolerance, could be toxicosis. Foreign body, when you have a foreign body, don't biopsy the stomach because the lesions are not representative. 
uh, systemic or metabolic diseases could cause infiltration of the uh, stomach and uh, the small intestine and also other parasitic or infectious diseases. So whenever you biopsy the stomach and you have uh, a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, think twice before giving cortisone. And also always estimate the uh, age of the animal. We will talk about IBD in a different lecture. And we will present a lot of cases with all the subcategories of IBD in order to know uh, what to do and how to handle them actually, and how to do uh, in terms of management of therapeutic regimes that we use. Um, let's see, gastric ulceration and erosions. Could be the, the gastric erosions are very, very, uh, are mucosal disruptions that are not ulcerated. And the gastric ulcers are penetrating the submucosa. Um, sometimes we have a raised thickened border if they're crater like uh, ulcers. And they could have yellow necrotic tissue or uh, a necrotic center. Never, ever biopsy the necrotic center because you will not have. Uh, a result, you will not have a diagnosis. Okay, the neoplastic ulcers most of the times are single. They're located in the incisura angularis, this landmark that I have shown you, and they're crater-like. The ulcers from uremia and from diffuse gastritis are um, mostly diffuse, as I said, from gastritis are mostly diffuse. For uremia, I have some news for you, but I will leave it for later to tell you. And the ulcers from non-steroidals are mostly in the antrum. So this is the video of a Yorkshire terrier that only took, that had uh, a patella problem and the orthopedic subscribed meloxicum in a, as a syrup and it only got one dose of meloxicum without gastroprotectant. And this is what happened. You can see the ulcers in the antral uh, region, dotted ulcers in the antrum, and there was no duodenal uh, ulcer in this animal. After the first dosage of meloxicum, this dog had fever, hematemesis, and melina, and um, beware of Yorkies. And also, when you want to give non-steroidals, please use some gastroprotection. What kind of gastroprotection should I use? This is another big subject. I know that most of you give PPI inhibitors. PPI inhibitors like lansoprazole, omeprazole, uh, pedoprazole, esomeprazole, they're not likely to stop the gastric ulceration. And here we see that there was no duodenal ulcer in this animal because you always have to pass the pylorus in order to see if there is a duodenal ulcer as well. Um, so as I was saying, it has been proven that PPI inhibitors can only uh, be used therapeutically and not prophylactically, and that the only agent that can act both prophylactically and therapeutically for non-steroidals is misoprostol. Okay, but we will talk about that uh, in another lecture. So this is what, this is actually, um, supposed to be a uremic gastritis and I will tell you why I do not agree anymore because there are some new data about that. So always biopsy the periphery of the ulcer, not the necrotic center. We've talked about that. And let's see a milder case of dotted ulcers. You can see these dotted ulcerated. This is the pylorus. And these are dotted small ulcers due to concurrent use of non-steroidals and glucocorticosteroids. Please do not do that. You know better than that now. We're better doctors than that. Um, you cannot give cortisone and then switch it on to non-steroidals. You have to, to at least give two or three days in between. If, if you, for example, you have used non-steroidals and the animal's not doing well for an orthopedic, for example, reason, um, please leave at least two or three days in order to uh, transition to corticosteroids. Okay. So you've seen the lesions. These are not dramatic. 
Uh, but these are only two days after the concurrent administration and the animals started vomiting. Um, actually over exaggerated vomiting compared to the lesions uh, that it had. So let's go to that. I'm very enthusiastic about that because we used to think that uh, uremic ulceration uh, was a reality and that uh, patients with chronic kidney disease could have um, gastric hemorrhage. This is being questioned right now. We don't have enough data or enough um, research on that, but the preliminary studies and this actually um, uh, study, this research paper by uh, Dr. Tolbert shows that they have measured the gastric pH and the serum gastric concentrations in uh, chronic kidney patients and in patients that are mostly cats. Uh, and in patients and in healthy uh, match control, uh, age match control cats, and it was normal, which means that the pH was not acidic. If you don't have acidic uh, pH, then you cannot have these cats that have chronic kidney failure do not need acid suppressants because you do not have acid production uh, in these patients. Of course, the limitations of this research, this is a huge you know, revelation because we, we used to give in all our uh, chronic kidney patients, uh, omeprazole and esomeprazole and PPI inhibitors. And this has caused other problems uh, on the other hand. Um, for example, diarrheas, because it has been proven that the PPI inhibitors when given in um, a long, uh, given long-term, they can cause uh, diarrheas and can disrupt um, the uh, microbiome of the intestine. So we try to use less uh, PPI inhibitors uh, in these days. So this is a revelation. We'll see if this is proven over the next uh, years with more research. The limitation of this uh, actually paper was that we had a very small sample size. I think that it was around uh, seven or nine cats that were um, uh, actually uh, measured uh, that had their gastric pH and their serum gastric concentrations measured. So we need a lot more research on that. But the preliminary uh, evidence is that there is no gastric acidity in chronic failure patients. So gastric Gastric acid hypersecretion, this is from textbooks, and now all of these will be, you know, maybe questioned about the uremia. Mastocytosis, yes, because we have the release of histamine. Gastrinoma, the pancreatic tumor, yes, because we have the release of gastrin, and this causes gastric acid uh, hypersecretion and ulceration. And in terms of uremia, I've already told you that this, uh, these all have been questioned. Let's see a gastrinoma, which is a pancreatic tumor. How do we do the diagnosis of gastrinoma? Certainly not with uh, gastroscopy. In gastroscopy, the only things that you will see is deep, deep ulcerations. These patients are severely diseased. They have intractable vomiting that cannot be handled with um, even the most potent antiemetic combination treatment, even if you use ondacidron or dolacidron or maropitan, these patients cannot be treated. They keep on vomiting and they have these uh, very, very bad ulcerations. And the only way that you can uh, actually uh, detect the gastrinomas is to have a gastric, to measure the gastric pH less than three and also uh, to measure the gastrin uh, concentrations, a very high gastrin concentrations, more than uh, 20 uh, units. Of course, every lab has its reference ranges. And um, it's very, very difficult also to detect the neoplastic tissue in the pancreas sometimes, especially in the beginning. You need CT scan, and even so, ultrasound, uh, especially in early stages, cannot detect because these are actually cells that are uh, functioning in a problematic way and give uh, high um, gastrin concentrations. Okay. 
And these dogs are presented with Melina, with the hematomesis. Let me see if someone has raised their hands. I've just seen someone. If it's by mistake. No, that's okay. Okay. Please feel free to ask. We're discussing cases here. If you have a similar case and you want to discuss it, we're here to discuss not only showcase uh, the uh, our cases. Okay. Um, mixed infiltrating uh, infiltrative uh, gastroenteritis uh, with helicobacter. And as I said, we don't have helicobacter pylori in dogs. We have the HLO, uh, HLO's organism, which most of the times are not pathogenic and they're bigger than the common uh, helicobacters, the ones that uh, are named as helicobacter pylori, for example. This is an intestine that has a bit of increased granularity. As you see, do I detect helicobacter in the intestine? Yes, you can detect helicobacter in the intestine and you can also detect helicobacter in the liver as well. So you see here all these ulcerated, this is a severe gastritis, okay? And this animal is also eating foreign bodies in order to, this is not caused by the foreign bodies. This is due to the gastritis, as I said, these animals exhibit this over um, a tendency to swallow foreign bodies. And you can see that we have dotted ulcerations and diffuse ulcerations. This is the incisura angularis. And I'm trying just to remove, you know, some foreign bodies to alleviate the discomfort, but they're really, really tiny. And this was a mixed infiltrating disease, eosinophilic lymphoplasmacytic gastritis, which was um, inflammatory bowel disease, but very, very progressed. Okay, and the beloved bilious syndrome, which is very, very easily solved if, you, um, if it goes to your mind. Um, have you ever had these small Maltese dogs, you know, that their owners complain that they have green uh, vomiting spots on their carpets? Every morning, this is bilious syndrome, okay? It has been uh, shown in humans, dogs, and cats. Uh, in humans, especially in the newborns, I, and um, in it's normal, it's considered to be normal in very, very young uh, dogs and cats because there is a reduced endogastric pressure and reduced uh, pyloric contraction, uh, contractions in the, uh, in the young kittens and puppies. Uh, the cause of the bilious syndrome is the irritation of the stomach uh, due to the effect of the bile. So whenever I have duodenogastric reflex disease, the bile that gets into the antral region causes gastritis, okay? And this causes morning vomiting. This happens to the animals that are not fed every, some animals, not all the animals, that are not fed every eight hours. So if their stomach is empty for more than uh, eight hours, around 12 hours, they have a morning uh, vomiting most of the time. Um, and of course, it has to do with the inability of the empty stomach to maintain the endogastric pressure, which is bigger than the uh, duodenal uh, pressure. Let's have a look at this. This is a cat, actually, but it's very well shown here. This is why I wanted to show it to you. So this is... Um, gastric content and it tries to get into the pylorus but it goes a bit out so at some point you will see that i'm trying to flush water in the pylorus to see what's going on to see the contractures uh, the contractions of the pylorus okay and this is food that just you know is, is just staying there not going anywhere so now i'm flushing and you will see the regurgitation from the duodenum to into the stomach again. So it goes in and it's spitting out again, as you see. This is very, very impressive because it goes in and then it goes, all the material is going out again in uh, the stomach. Okay. And this is actually not yesterday, two days ago. 
a, ca uh, a cat as well. And you're going to see what's happening to this cat. This is the Incisura angularis. This is on the 13th of March. This is the Incisura angularis. We have diffuse gastritis, and there, there's a suspicion of lymphoma for this case. Uh, but we are going to send it to, to the CT uh, for a CT scan. And we did FNAs from uh, mesenteric lymph nodes. And we took biopsies, and we're waiting for this cat. It's a cachectic cat, actually. Um, huge, massive weight loss. You see that. This animal has been fasted for 15 hours and yet all the uh, stomach is full of material. So now we're going into the pylorus. You see all the, the vessels in the cat. So this is the pylorus. And can you see here the movement from the, the pylorus is open and all the content from the duodenum goes into the pylorus. I have to show you again. You see? The flow of the content from the pylori, it's, it's coming out from the uh, from the intestine. Instead of going the right way, it goes the other way round. Okay, this is bile coming out from the pylori. So this cat has duodenogastric reflex disease as well. Okay. Gastric neoplasia, lymphosarcoma, adenos, adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, you will not see it in the stomach like that. It's a diffuse disease. Intestinal lymphoma and gastrointestinal lymphoma, you will only diagnose it with, most of the times, with full thickness biopsies of the intestines and FNAs from the mesenteric lymph nodes or from the spleen, if it's multicentric, from the uh, liver. Um, this is how you diagnose lymphoma. But for lymphosarcoma, uh, where we see thickening and irregularity in the mucosa, adenocarcinoma, which is a very defined mass, ulcerated mass most of the times in the incisura angularis and the polyps that I show you later, you can have a preliminary idea from your endoscopic picture. And that's one month ago. Um, that's a very, very, that's a Westie that hasn't lost any weight, but had um, periodical vomitings and anorexia episodes. So we got in, and this is a very, very early stage of adenocarcinoma. Most of the times we do not catch these, the disease. You see the ulceration here, and it's very, very well defined. This is the, this is the crater of the ulcer, and it's in the, the incisura angularis so again, no pyloric uh, infiltration in this case. This is a very early stage. Most of the times I will show you how we find these uh, carcinomas. And you see the alteration of the mucosa here. The mucosa has been, to has totally, the gastric mucosa has totally lost the, uh, its normal structure. So most of the times when we see adenocarcinomas are like that. And Right now, um, I'm thinking about how often I see adenocarcinomas, at least three times every month. So you see this deep, deep ulcerated area. This is a huge adenocarcinoma of an animal, uh, of a Sharpe, actually. And we have this uh, case in Alphabet. Please visit to see the whole case uh, when we finish. Uh, you see the alteration of the mucosa here. Uh, the mucosa uh, is totally... Um, is, is totally abnormal. And there is uh, also an infiltration of the pyloric region. Um, this dog had to endure total gastrectomy, which was not possible. Um, and you saw how big the ulcer and how deep the ulcer was. Have a visit in Alhavet and see the whole case and what we did. This is how most of my adenocarcinomas look. The prior case of the Westie was an exception. It was not the norm. And let's go to the intestine. We finished with the stomach. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of lectures on certain diseases of the stomach and intestine. So we're gonna go into more depth about management and about diagnosis and uh, diagnosing modalities. 
alongside with the endoscopic modality as well. So the duodenum, the mucosa is pink. It looks like velvet. Sometimes it looks like these the corals of the um, in the sea. Um, the submucosal vessels are not visible in the small intestine, where they are visible in the large intestine, as we will uh, mention later. So in dogs, we have the major duodenum, uh, duodenal papilla, uh, where the common bite duct enters, and the minor, we have two papillas, and the minor uh, duodenal papilla, not in all dogs, but most of the dogs. Um, these are small white uh, protuberances, I will show you. Most of the times you will not see them. You will lose them because you enter the duodenum uh, with force and uh, you try to proceed. So you don't see these uh, papillas. Most of the times they're visible when you withdraw back to the uh, pylorus. In cats, there is no minor duodenum papilla. And of course, always watch, you know, the Payet patches. Do not biopsy the Payet patches. Uh, these are visible as oval depressions uh, in the duodenum. Okay, this is the major duodenum papilla. These are the Payet patches. Uh, these are like uh, depressions in the mucosa. And if you biopsy these areas, you will find so many lymphocytes because these are, uh, you know, really rich in lymphocytes and it will give you a wrong impression of uh, the disease that your animal has. And this is the normal mucosa. The normal mucosa looks like velvet, looks like, you know, uh, smooth, no irregularities, no erythema or uh, hyperemia, no erosion, no ulcers. And another thing that I want you to be aware of is that when you go into uh, with it with the endoscope, if you find, if while withdrawing, you see linear lesions, then it's you, you have caused that. Okay, it's not lesions that uh, were there in the beginning. So let's see a small, uh, a normal uh, small intestine in a cat. You see that everything in the cat looks more pale, okay? And this cat has trichobezoars, hair, always cats licking hair. So you could have going in, when you go from the, uh, ascending to the descending duodenum and then to um, proceeding uh, in the intestine, in the intestinal lumen, you will have some areas of a red doubt. This is an area of a red doubt of the curves um, in order to find your lumen and you should always get into your lumen. There are two biopsy techniques. The first biopsy technique is the blind one that you just proceed your forceps up until you don't see your forceps and it makes a curve. And this was a peristaltive wave now that you saw in the intestine. So you proceed your forceps up until you do not see it anymore. And you take blindly the biopsy. Most of the time, this is the way, this is the, the one that I'm showing uh, to you now. I'm just proceeding with no visibility. I don't like taking these kind of biopsies because they're smaller. You do not know where you biopsy. And most of the times your, your biopsies are really, really small. The other technique is that you go out of the endoscope and you just have your forceps very, very close to the endoscope and you do 90 degrees on the uh, mucosa. And this gives you better uh, control of the uh, intestine, uh, better control of the of the, your scope. I'm sorry, and better bi uh, biopsy uh, punches. Okay, so you take your biopsies while going out. Now I'm trying to do the close technique. You see how close my forceps is, and I go. Now you don't see anything because I go into the mucosa. And also, I take the air out so that it comes up to me, as I said before. And you see how deep this biopsy was. Okay, this was a close biopsy. So we have these two techniques. And I'm taking from every part of the intestine as I go out, as I am withdrawing, first from the intestine and then from the stomach. Okay, 
why do I take biopsies if I say that this intestine seems to be normal? Because I have to. You will never, never uh, have the chance to do it again. So you will take your biopsies and you will send them even if you don't see any microscopic lesions. Okay, and then I withdraw to the pylorus, back to the stomach. You see some glistening. This is, this is a bit edematous because it's very, very glistening and it shouldn't be that glistening in the intestine. Okay. And this is the procedure. We withdraw a bit, take a biopsy. We withdraw a bit and take a biopsy sample. This is a bit rare to have a duodenal ulcer in a cat, and we have no clue. Uh, this was a neutrophilic ulcer, actually, maybe due to a foreign body that was preceded. This is duodenum, and you see a big ulcerated area in a cat, maybe due to a foreign body because it was a neutrophilic, uh, it had a neutrophilic infiltration. It was not neoplastic. Okay. So, we try to take a biopsy, sorry, from the periphery uh, again. You see how deep the ulcerated area in the duodenum is, and this cat was not on non-steroidals. So you always have to ask about toxins, about drugs, uh, administration of drugs, about everything. Inflammatory diseases, infiltration of lymphoplasmacytic, um, uh, lymphoplasmacytic infiltration, eosinophilic infiltration, uh, neutrophilic infiltration, or mixed infiltrations. What do we see? Most of the times we see granularity, increased granularity, friability, hemorrhages, erosions, uh, reduced peristalsis. Beware of the linear hemorrhages, as I told you. Let's have a look. Can you see these white membranes? You see the irregularity. These are not digested, uh, undigested materials, and it's not uh, lymph, uh, you, because you will see that the same material is in the stomach as well. Uh, so we see an irregularity of the mucosa, and this is a mild case. We have more prominent cases that I, I will show you. So you withdraw and take biopsies, withdraw and take biopsies. Here the area is a bit better. And then you go out to the pylorus. Let's see some more severe cases. Okay. And if I show you the next three videos, can anyone tell me which one of them is progressed IBD, lymphagectasia, or lymphoma? No, you cannot endoscopically. They are exactly the same. Exactly the same. Severe IBD, lymphoma cases, and lymphagectasia sometimes, because with lymphagectasia, we can have other clues as well, have the exact same um, microscopic image. So let's see that one. This is a severe uh, IBD, moderate to severe. The lesions, the infiltration that came out was moderate to severe, lymphoplasmacytic. And this was one of the, uh, and also this, this uh, dog had low albumin uh, count as well, low cholesterol. You always measure these in intestinal diseases. You've seen how irregular the mucosa is. Lymphagectasia, always look for the secondary um, for, we have the primary lymphagectasia, which is idiopathic or congenital, and we have the secondary. The secondary lymphagectasia could be uh, localized in the intestine uh, due to IBD, due to small intestinal neoplasia like lymphoma, for example. Um, and also, you should always check if you find intestinal lymphagectasia, then you should always check the heart. Uh, maybe we have a congestive heart failure or we have some some. Uh, other kind of uh, diseases. And these are the breeds, especially the Yorkies and the Rottweilers are very, very prone to lymphagectasia cases. 
and this is the lymphagectasia. And what are the uh, case? Uh, what are the endoscopic? You see here the lacteals, uh, multiple white spot indicating uh, that we have dilated uh, lacteals. We have these white spots and also these whitish spots. Most of the times when you go into uh, and scoping a lymphagectasia case, you know that it has lymphagectasia. Um, but you trust trying. We have a normal peristalsis as well. Um, never ever scope an animal that has a recent meal because it might look like it has lymphagectasia due to the dilated lacteals. Okay. And of course, this animal had small intestinal diarrhea. Very low albumin count, protein losing enteropathy. And then we had these cases that were not that severe and that had these white spots areas either um, with a variation in distribution, a lot of white spots, less, few, or, you know, moderate white spots in the, um, in the intestine. And then we were wondering, these animals are not severely diseased. What are these white spots? Are they distended lacteals as well? No, they were like, some of my, some of my residents used to tell me that, uh, are these rice that the dog did not digest? And I was saying, no, this is due to low albumins count. And they have made, uh, this actually was published in uh, 2011, uh, the white spots in the mucosal surface of the uh, duodenum. And what do they mean? Uh, so these snowflake-like or rice grain-like uh, uh, lesions are indicative of low serum protein and low uh, albumin uh, concentrations most of the times. And um, they're not an exclusive find finding uh, in uh, intestinal lymphagectasia. You can have these spots without having intestinal lymphagectasia if you have low protein counts. Let's see this doc here. This is pretty, pretty amazing. This is extraordinary. Do you see these white spots? So this dog does not have lymphagectasia. It just has a low protein count. And we actually diagnosed that because we took biopsies and we, we um, confirmed that this was not a lymphagectasia no, uh, case. But you can see how prominent these white spots are. Actually, my colleagues were right. They look like undigested rice, like this animal had a can of, you know, a uh, clinical diet and it could not digest the rice. The image is extraordinary. And of course, if we want to comment on the mucosa, you can see the irregularity, but not very, you know, it's not a very prominent case. And it was very friable. In biopsies, the friability was really, really um, prominent. Okay, so whenever you see those white spots, I hope that you had the preliminary workup, blood work, and that you already know that your dog has low protein count or even border uh, borderline low. It doesn't have to be a hypobuminemic state. Uh, it could be just borderline low and you will see these white spots. And this is a lymphoma case, which is pretty much the same as uh, a severe IBD case. You see the increased granularity and friability. When we talk about intestinal neoplasia, we can have polyps, leiomyomas, adenomas, fibromas, and of course, malignant lymphoma with a more diffuse um, uh, thickening, like the severe IBD and adenocarcinoma. But this was a lymphoma case. You can see the irregularity of the mucosa. Uh, it was very friable. Whenever you, wa you wanted to biopsy the mucosa, it was very 
I mean, you got a whole chunk of the of the intestine. Okay. These are severe cases that you understand, even if you're not experienced, that they are really something really bad is going on. And this is a pellet in the duodenum, undigested. Okay, this is a pretty amazing picture. Let's go and see what happens. And I think that's pretty much my last case. You can see this case as well in Al Havet. Uh, this was a case of a dog that had intestinal obstructions uh, from a seed, from a fruit seed. Um, sometimes when you have intestinal obstruction, you can miss it in the ultrasound. But you will have an animal that has that starts have uh, that starts getting hypoalbuminemic. Uh, you will see in the ultrasound the intestinal uh, in the intestinal loops the content to be uh, regurgitating, to be going back and forth and not to be proceeding. And you will have gastric retention of fluids and also um, intractable vomiting and projectile vomiting. The animal will not be able to digest anything. So as you may see, this is severe esophagitis, stage three, because it's in circular forms and in linear forms up to the um, pharyngeal esophagus. So this dog has been vomiting for more than two weeks and it, this has caused severe um, esophagitis and you will, of course, no ulceration, but when we have linear lesions in the circumference, then this is stage two to stage three. And you will see now with AUHA um, endoscope, we have the ability to turn the hemoglobin on. It's very prominent. And now that it's on, this is the hemoglobin enhancement. Then you can see better the esophagitis status and all the erosions and lesions. Okay. Now they're very, very clear to you. And it's up to... It's throughout the length of the esophagus. So if we go into the stomach, you will see that we have huge gastric retention. And you say something is wrong. I mean, this gastric content, it's like a pool. There's somewhere there is an obstruction. Is it in the pylorus? Is it in the intestine? This is something that you will find out. And when we, it was not in the pylorus. So when we went into the intestine, you see that the intestine is pretty normal. This poor animal has not, not an intestinal disease. Give me some minutes to, to have the vision cleared because we have a lot of retrograde movement of the, um, of the intestinal uh, fluids of the duodenal juices because they cannot be forwarded. So I have always to suck. And this is where the foreign body is embedded. And this is a seed from an apricot, I think. Can I take out, can I retrieve the foreign body from the intestine? Don't ever do that. No, this is a surgical case. We can retrieve foreign bodies from the stomach. We can never retrieve foreign bodies from the intestine. Okay, it's very dangerous. Um, and this was actually, uh, this has gone uh, to surgery uh, with enterotomy and the foreign body was uh, retrieved. And the dog was happy again to swallow more foreign bodies and make us rich. So this was pretty much everything. Um, I hope that I was on time this time, Jason. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to, to discuss with you your cases, your questions. Yeah, Thank please. you. Thank you all for the time. to ask any questions. Um, well, uh, maybe you can learn more things uh, after, the, uh, after our webinar. Uh, we have Facebook. Uh, YouTube channel and the LinkedIn, and we also have some uh, clinical cases, 
uh, in our YouTube channel. You can search all our events uh, on YouTube to subscribe us to uh, find more <coughs> clinical knowledges. And uh, I thought maybe uh, you guys want to know uh, the first uh, our first uh, webinar. Uh, maybe you missed it. Don't worry, we will upload uh, our webinar record on our YouTube channel. And the first uh, webinar record has been uploaded. And uh, today's uh, <clears throat> today's record we will upload later. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending, everyone from all over the world. And um, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Um, visit Auhavet because every month we will be uploading clinical cases and not only uh, the endoscopic um, part, but the whole diagnostic approach part. And uh, whoever missed the, the webinar can actually. Um, Reseed, rewatch it again. And we will be every month here uh, to, you know, just to, to build up a community and discuss our cases. Bring, please, next time, bring your cases as well. We will announce the topic. And if you have relevant cases that you want us to discuss, do not hesitate. This is why we're here. Um, we are here to exchange, as Jason said, ideas. We are here to build up a platform of open discussions. And um, you know, to ask questions without being hesitant or shy, because we're all here to learn. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, Vasiliki. Thank you for your brilliant presentation. So hope we will meet next month. Yeah, and also, if you have any suggestions of the topics that you would like uh, me to present, uh, not only in gastroscopy or colonoscopy that we have it uh, ahead, in other kinds of scoping like bronchoscopy, rhinoscopy, please tell your, you know, your put your demands and we will we will do it for you. Yeah, please contact us. Uh, our, uh, each channel you like on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube. So today, uh, today is over. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Greetings from Greece, and I will see you next month. I do not know from which point of earth I will be, but in which country I will be, but yeah. we will be together. Yeah. Okay, see you next time. See you. Bye. Bye.